is if true to say, maybe it isn't, but I'm going to follow this train of thought that maybe highly creative individuals are um, actually somehow changing the way that their brain is operating and, and uh, I'm going to use the word functioning potentially incorrectly, but this, you know, the fact that you can see those, those stronger connections, uh, it, is that, is that a naive thing to consider? We can, <laughs> we can, we can make our brains more creative. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting point. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think people are consciously changing the way their brain functions unless they are hooked mm. up to an MRI machine doing a neurofeedback study <laughs> where that's the kind of goal to do that. Um, I think kind of potentially in these studies, what you're seeing is, you know, you're seeing correlation. It's very difficult to prove causation. So what that means is like we can show that people who are more creative might have kind of better connectivity um, with the default mode network and with those regions. But you can't really, from those studies, say, okay, so were they more creative in the first place? Mm. Um, like, did they have that stronger connection in their brain already? And that's why <laughs> they are highly creative. Um, or have they engaged in so many creative activities because that is, you know, their job or that is kind of what they were drawn to or motivated to do that as a consequence, these networks have become stronger in their brain. Um, essentially, we don't know the answer to that without running very longitudinal studies where you kind of, you know, you get people at the beginning and you give them lots of creative stuff and see if the connections and networks in their brain change. Um, but I would say my, my inclination is that I do, there is obviously an element of, of nature in our brain and how it's formed, but I sit a lot more on the kind of nurture side. So I think the experiences in our lives really do nurture and shape our brain. Um, and I'm talking like right from childhood. We know that early childhood experiences and things like that can actually cause like structural differences in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it's not so far to think that the experiences that you have from a young child and through your education and even as a young adult and an adult and so on, kind of shape the way that your brain is able to function so I mean it feels like this is still emerging area and this is a bit that gets really interesting for like, the work the work that we do in terms of how can we enable perhaps think about consciously um, you know building a mindset that enables us to be you know, more, more creative. And you touched on that thought of, and I appreciate it's a thought at this stage that is it, is it the fact that we've just engaged in more creative, you know, creative activity? Um, and I'm, I'm making an assumption here that that's potentially what you might start to be seeing in, in the work that you're doing in your PhD, uh, almost like a bit of a, a bit of a hypothesis that might be working through that as well. But I mean, have you come across anywhere with a, a from the world of neuroscience kind of what's what's a creative practice or a creative task that actually you know builds that and I don't know you might not have an answer but. <laughs> yeah no I mean it's um it's definitely something that I'm actively kind of doing in my work at the moment is looking at this yeah this concept of kind of creativity in the brain um and you know, as kind of mentioned that this disrupt thinking is this kind of sweet spot where you kind of evaluate it and understand it and have come up with a creative solution. Um, I think there's a study that was done in 2012 that actually links quite well with the, with the kind of like this idea of zooming out and zooming back in. So um, this guy called uh, Benjamin Bard asked people to complete a classic test of creativity, which is called um, the unusual uses task, sometimes the alternative uses task. Um, basically in this task, very simple, people just have to come up with uh, as many uses as possible for a very common object. So, you know, I could give you a brick <laughs> and um, maybe I'll ask you on this one, I'll give you a brick and, mm. you know, give me five uses for a brick. Okay, five uses for a brick. Um, doorstop. Yeah. Probably build a house. 
tiny, <laughs> tiny part of a house. Um, here's a random one for uh, environmentalists. Put it in your cistern of the toilet so that you don't doesn't fill with so much water. Oh. Learned that one the other day. Right, that's three random ones. Two, uh, keeping the lid on the wheelie bin that I can see outside the window <laughs> in in this in, in the wind. And a final one. Uh, giving you extra height to reach something in a cupboard. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I mean, there was some quite creative ones there. <laughs> but so essentially you kind of give people a set amount of time and they have hmm. to kind of list as many and then you kind of mark them for... So you can assess people for things like fluency. So right. I'd say you were quite fluent there, like in terms of how kind of fluently and quickly could you like draw off all these ideas or were there like some real pauses and stunts? You obviously look for the uniqueness of mm. the ideas. So, you know, building a house, building a wall might be less creative. Whereas I think putting it in the toilet <laughs> was a very, cre- I was like, oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> um, and yeah, you essentially, you know, people are asked to do this to kind of come up and you can assess someone's kind of creative potential very simply in this kind of lab based task. Um So what um, Barr did in this 2012 study is Mm. he kind of split people into three groups um, and he gave them, they were kind of shown the object um, and they noted down their initial ideas and then they were split so that group one were allowed to rest for 12 minutes. Group two for 12 minutes were given a very simple, like not very demanding or difficult task. Um, and group three were given a very hard task to do for 12 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and after 12 minutes, the three groups came back and they all had to return to the task and try and come up with some, some more ideas for their initial list. Um, and the results actually showed that the, the second group who were given the kind of undemanding task for 12 minutes showed a 40% rise in creativity compared to the two other conditions um and you know the kind of authors and the theory behind why is because the relatively easy task meant their mind could kind of start to wander off the problem at hand um Mm. and it might seem surprising because we've spoken about it obviously it's like the resting state network and the default mode that the rest condition didn't it didn't improve their creativity um but the kind of authors of this paper suggested that we actually might need some type of distraction to provoke the optimum amount of mind wandering. Um, And I think we can all relate to this, that if you have absolutely nothing to do, you might actually still think about the problem too much. (laughs) So, you know, we've kind of all experienced that where you, there's a problem at work that you're stuck on and then you go away and you just find yourself sitting there just still thinking about it. Um, And perhaps what this is suggesting that you actually need to engage in some other task, which is quite easy to do, but still maybe requires a little bit of attention. But essentially, you kind of go into like autopilot mode um, to really allow the optimal mind wandering. Um, I'm thinking driving might be like a good one because you obviously are driving. Fully concentrated on the road. (laughs) You know, I'm just thinking about the times when I've been driving and how your mind can just wander to all these thoughts. <laughs>